So before we dive right in, we want to know where people are joining us from. And to get a sense of where everyone is located, please point to where you're calling from on the map. To do this, use the arrow key in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, right above the WebEx presentation you're currently viewing. Click the arrow key and then click on the map where you're located. We have folks calling in from California, South Carolina, Rosemary and I are located in Boston. Great. So if you didn't get a chance to put your error on the map, please chat into the chat box um, and say where you're located. We're really interested in learning more about where everybody is calling in from. With that, I'm going to pass over the ball to you, Rosemary, and you can take it away. Thanks so much, Naomi. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to uh, our webinar training on bringing advanced care conversations to congregations. I'm delighted to be with you here and to talk with you more about a topic I think so many of us get on, maybe got on this call for in the first place is to learn about how to bring programming into your congregations. Joining me tonight to help out, we are going to be delighted. We're delighted to have Audrey Marsh joining us from Columbia, Maryland. Some of you may have heard Audrey on one of our earlier calls talking about measurement, and she may touch a little bit on that tonight when we're going to uh, be having a conversation with her in the second half of this call. Now, I met Mar Audrey um, about a year and a half ago, I think, maybe almost two years now. Um, when we were doing some work in Columbia, Maryland with the Howard County Speakeasy program. This was an effort uh, in the county to engage healthcare communities and congregations in having conversations about what matters most for the sake of developing a registry and getting people to uh, register their advanced care um, planning documents, including their healthcare agents, on this central uh, website. Uh, in the process of working together with various congregations, um, Audrey learned a lot about how to set aims and make plans and engage her congregation, and she indeed became the ministry lead for a new ministry at her Roman Catholic Church, St. John the Evangelist, called Your Gift, The Gift of Peace, and we'll be hearing more about that this evening. Audrey works very closely with uh, another ministry inside of her church called Resurrection Mis Ministry, which is about um, attending to the details of Catholic funerals. And an outgrowth of the work, and this is so interesting, you know, this work can start and it can grow. They identified a need for a grief ministry, um, that this was one of the unattended needs in the congregation. She, uh, her work has led to her being a consultant for the Horizon Foundation, which was the original funder of the Speakeasy Howard project, and is, they're still very engaged in spreading that work uh, from the beta project to a wider project in the county. And one of the things that uh, was fascinating to me to, was to learn that she is a, a retired engineer and computer scientist from the Department of Defense. So uh, that may be why Audrey was a natural when it came to our measurement and said, Ames, but she's been a great leader, and we look forward to hearing more from her. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Audrey. So for this evening's session, what we hope you will take away will be some insight into the importance skillfully produced programming can have on improving outcomes for having the conversation and completing advanced care planning documents. We hope you'll take away some ideas for how to plan and implement topic-related programming in your setting, and also some very specific examples of ways to track and evaluate your programs. To do all that, tonight our agenda will be going through a number of things. We'll be talking about how to assess the need and desire, as well as the resources you have available in your setting to engage in programming. I say this because I come again from uh, being a clergy in a con very busy congregation, and I know that sometimes it feels like all we were doing was programming. And as a clergy person, I might wonder if you were approaching me with this idea, do we really need another program? So 
having some data, having an assessment ready to present and share with your lead clergy could be a very helpful um, set of information to share and be convincing in, in bringing this forward. We'll talk a little bit about the importance of planning and testing in order to have skillful implementation on a wider scale. We'll share ideas for planning, implementing, and tracking topic-related programming in your setting. We have some great examples from the field. For those of you who have already reviewed the Getting Started in Congregations guide, some of this will be familiar, and some of it will be new information. We'll have very specific example from the field from our guest presenter, Audrey, Marsh, and we will again talk about the value of evaluations and why this is useful. Uh, while I'm at this point, I'm just going to make a little plug for those of you who are super interested in measurement, tracking, and evaluation. Tomorrow afternoon between 3 and 4, the Conversation Project will be hosting its quarterly community call, and this time the focus will be on that that topic, and believe it or not, uh, Audrey Marsh will be the guest there as well. We're doing, she's doing double duty for the conversation project this week. I want to begin as we always do by uh, opening up the chat. Actually, the chat is always open, but at this moment to note that if you have any questions that arose out of the content from last week on pastoral care, we hope that you will put your question into the chat, and that way we can aim to weave answers into the session. And if we can't do that, we'll follow up with some tips or information in our follow-up email. So right now, if you have any questions, we would love to hear from you. And let me remind you any time as we're going along, if something pops up in your mind, uh, please go ahead and chat it in. And between uh, Naomi and myself, we'll look to see what your questions are and try to address them either in the moment um, or a little later on in the call. Now, we know that change takes place because people decide to take action. And we've asked week after week, what action do you want to take? And we know that inside of congregations, there are a lot of actions that can be taken. And they fall primarily into three categories, two of which we've already addressed, talking about sermons. We've also talked a little bit about pastoral care. And tonight, we'll be talking about programming. Thanks for your question, Margaret, and we will be talking about that as we go along. She is asking, is there a role for medical personnel in the programming presented in a congregation? And the uh, short answer is absolutely, and the more complicated answer is let me share some examples as we get on with specific examples uh, in the call. Thanks for chatting in. So. There are so many different things that can happen in a congregation in terms of ideas for programming. Uh, some of you already have examples of having started programming in your congregations, perhaps on another topic. Uh, very often, these can be one-off programs. Someone has a great idea. Let's try it. Let's do it. Let's put on a show, whatever it is. Uh, and we go ahead and do it. And that's just kind of built that way if we're doers, if we're innovators, if we have a little entrepreneurial spirit, if we perceive a need. One of the ways that we address it is by having a program. So that's great. I've done it myself. I know that it can be successful just by doing it because you have a, a, a felt sense of the need there, and you have some expertise, some time, and some resources, and you put it together, and it is successful. And we have a strong sense that to be to guarantee or be closer to guaranteeing success in your setting for any kind of programming, that you might want to stop, pause, and assess the need and the desire, as well as what resources might be available for any kind of programming. It's almost uh, a small it's a small business plan in a way. It's like saying, well, what do we want to do? Who do we want to reach? 
when do we want to reach them by, how will we reach them, and what do we hope they'll do after they've attended this program. So we had an interesting experience of working with a group of 10 Jewish congregations over the past year, and we learned something, as we always do when we work out in the community, and that is something as straightforward, it might seem, as doing a pre-planning survey to assess what the congregational interests and needs are. So there was a group at uh, Temple Hatfilo in on the West Coast who thought, well, we have a sense that this is a need that we should be talking about end of life care and some things that, some topics that surround that. But I wonder, would people show up? Would they really be interested? Do they want this or can they get this someplace else? So they designed a survey with a set of questions. They knew what some of the programming was that they could offer based on the expertise they had in their group. And they also consulted with their senior rabbi about what um, he thought might be a useful uh, programming idea. They included all of those ideas in their survey, like would you be interested in A? Would you be interested in B? And then there was, of course, a set of a, a set space for what else would you be interested in? And in doing that, they found not only did they get validation for the ideas that they had, and a sense of the strength of the interest in the programming ideas they had. It also surfaced a number of people who had additional expertise in the congregation. Since the survey was put out as like, we're just curious, people felt open to responding with saying, I could help, rather than feeling perhaps closed out because it was already a done deal and no one ever even approached them. So that was an exciting uh, co-design that they shared with us and we pass on to you. Some of the other things that you're wanting to assess, you talked, we've talked about interest, we talked about uh, expertise, but in a busy congregation especially, or in a small building especially, you have to look at things like room space. Where is a room available and when is it available? Who do you have to coordinate with in order to make sure you get on the calendar? And by when do you have to do this so that you get into all of your congregational communications channels, right? Uh, and will this actually cost any money? Sometimes as volunteers, we, we, uh, we invest a lot in our congregations in terms of time and energy. And sometimes we're actually the ones contributing some money to make that event happen. Doing some pre-planning and assessment from the very beginning will let people know, well, where is the money going to come from for the bagels or the donuts or the coffee? And who's going to actually brew it or go pick it up at Dunkin' Donuts? <laughs> so you want to be able to do that assessment right from the very beginning so you know what resources you have, uh, what you can invest in this programming, and this will help in ensuring your success. When Audrey gets on the call, she'll talk to us a little bit more about this, but I want to make the point now that it is important as well as in addition to assessing and planning, you want to test what you're doing in order to have skillful implementation for a larger rollout. As we mentioned in our guide for congregations, a lot of us want to go out and just change the whole world right now and have everyone join us in our great idea. And that's fabulous to have that kind of enthusiasm. And we recommend that in taking something on, like the content that you're looking to bring to the congregation, how you present that information, how you organize it, how you set up your timing, how you even set up the room, how you give people instructions for now let's break up into uh, pairs to share, or let's now share with the whole room. What do we notice in how we give instructions? So we recommend that you test your programming first, if possible, something like a workshop, um, that you test that first with a small receptive group who'd be willing to give you feedback on everything from how the room was set up to your presentation style to the content and its application. Now, of course, you can't do this with a panel where you've invited three out of uh, congregation guests to come and present. You are going to have to go based on your experience of doing programming like that in the past. 
But for something like a workshop, we encourage you to think about doing this with a small group first before inviting what could turn out, as in the case of St. John the Evangelist, 100 or 200 people in the room. Early uh, last week, we, had, we heard from Reverend Gloria White Hammond, who told us a little bit about the programming that they have led at Bethel AME in Boston, Massachusetts. And she told us a little bit about how they started small and how they weren't so sure that this was going to work. And now, three years into the program, it is infused into the life cycle of her congregation. It's a program that people rely on seeing new offerings from their planning ahead ministry on a regular basis. In the second half of this call, we'll hear more about programming that St. John the Evangelist uh, has been engaged in in Columbia, Maryland. And now I'd like to just share with you um, some innovative programming that the Boulder Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship has engaged in. And I'll begin by saying that in Boulder Valley, they have a team that uh, got interested in the conversation project right from the start. So they've been at this for about five years. They've held a number of starter kit workshops. They've had some preaching from the pulpit from by both their lead clergy and also lay members. Um, and they've had panels on a variety of topics. But what I want to share with you now is one of their more expansive programs that they just had recently, which was a five-part workshop series called Deepening the Conversation About End of Life. Because they had done so many conversation starter kit workshops, most of the members of their congregation have been through the process of starting to have the conversation, and more and more questions arose. Just as we'll hear from Audrey about the growth and the need for the grief ministry, Boulder Valley has identified that people have other questions that on a spiritual level and they held these sessions on Saturday mornings from 9 to 11.30 a.m. They found that this time worked well. It gave people um, who were working a chance to attend and yet early enough in the morning so that they had the rest of their weekend to do whatever they wanted to do. And they were able to rely on a variety of experts or people with expertise within their community. And also they reached out into the broader community to bring uh, the content to their folks. So you can see, for those of you who are on a computer, uh, there's a list of all the things that they covered. For those of you who are calling in, they had a session on what does it mean to die well, sort of a philosophical and ethical look at the end of life. Also, meaning making at the end of life, how to do this as a spiritual practice, how to engage in reflection and understanding how do we as, as human beings make meaning out of suffering and loss. They uh, had someone come in who introduced a Buddhist approach to finding peace with the self and others in a topic that was called compassion, forgiveness, and conciliation. They brought in people from outside the congregation to talk about funeral practices uh, that create meaning. So both people from the funeral industry, but also um, people internally who talked about ritual. And they had a special session, a final session, on writing your own obituary, a part of your legacy, how to create an obituary that tells the world why you mattered. Now, of course, being a congregation, you can really focus and go deep on these spiritual matters. Interestingly, um, the Boulder UU Fellowship also did a program that was out in the community, they partnered with the library and moved the programming from inside their walls to something that happened outside their walls. They were the sponsors of it, and they provided the conversation facilitators for the program. But it was um, a series, again, five-week series called The End, which were movies and mortality. So they had a, lot, a number of short documentaries, um, animated films. They hosted it at the public library in Lafayette, and they watched movies together and then talked about it together. So I thought that was kind of interesting. A movie night internally or an all-book read is another kind of program that you could be hosting. 
we've heard about congregations that have gone and done something. We talked at the very beginning that congregations sometimes like to eat together, right? So we've seen things like um, death over dinner or potluck dinner where people come together around a table with focused questions and with each course of the meal there's a new question and they encourage people to talk about that and not other kinds of things that sometimes we talk about when we gather for food events. One congregation also had a take your agent to dinner event near th a Valentine's Day and the idea was you were to invite as your date the person you've chosen to be your healthcare agent and to have dinner at the congregation, again, for a focused conversation with others about what matters most. And that was a very animated and moving uh, evening for a lot of people. Um, Margaret had asked earlier if there's a role for medical personnel in programming in a congregation. And Ronnie answered, uh, Ronnie Gesner from Atlanta answered that yes, that next week she'll be sharing how her synagogue used medical personnel who are also congregation members. Um, so she's going to be talking with us on the call next week very specifically. And we've seen congregations that have brought in um, medical personnel as part of a panel or a program to talk about um, what are some of the things that happen in the ICU. So at Bethel AME, they are using the film Extremis and then with physicians facilitating a conversation about what could be a disturbing or upsetting look at the uh, medical interventions that happen in the ICU, but to give people a real sense of what kinds of decisions may have to be made. And having someone with a medical background to help guide that conversation, to explain things to people, and be there to answer questions from both a medical and sometimes bringing along someone from an ethical point of view, if that's necessary. I've also seen people um, or programs in which palliative and hospice care professionals come in from the your surrounding area so they can explain to people what the programs and care options are uh, both at home or in facilities uh, when it comes to hospice and in general what is palliative care. So I think that's a great conversation to have. Other panels could be um, more on the uh, topic of things like having an estate attorney, a financial planner, a funeral director to come in and talk, again, this idea of making plans before there's a crisis, a panel to explain how to organize your information at home so that your family can find it when they need to. You might also have a panel, again, we talk back to hospice, where you have maybe a local hospice, a VNA coming in and talking, along with people in your congregation who have um, been hospice volunteers, perhaps, or have recently gone through an experience where their family member has been through hospice. So people can talk from a very personal point of view what the value of that was. I've also been um, part of a panel in an Islamic um, center where an Islamic scholar was part of our presentation setting up the um, the background for why have this conversation and explaining what the theological legal issues are in their faith that are very pertinent to making end of life decision making and even writing a will that is um, not just a secular legal will but also an Islamic legal will. And finally, something that we didn't include in our actual, um, in our guide is I think a program on caregiving would be a very valuable um, thing to do inside of a congregation. How do we, how do we support our caregivers, our people who are at home taking care of someone? Uh, I just heard a, something on the radio driving today that the number of people under 40 who are going to be in the role of caregivers is growing exponentially as the baby boomers age, that their adult children are going to be taking care of them. And if this isn't a good reason to start talking to people uh, who are younger, I don't know what is, but there is a boom uh, already happening and that those numbers are only going to grow. So talking about the pressures um, that caregivers uh, are under 
and also how we as a congregation can support one another in that role. I'm just checking out in the chat. Ed is, Jones is asking, would it be possible to get a few examples of needs assessment surveys by email? And the answer is um, even better than that, Ed. <laughs> we have some of those things available for you online, and I'm going to tell you about those in just a second. And Sandra Pico has also um, chatted in that at her church, St. John the Baptist, also in Columbia, Maryland, they brought in a hospice director, a psychologist, a pastor, and attorney on a panel to respond after watching the movie Being Mortal, a wonderful uh, all, all congregation event. When I talked before about doing the assessment, um, I it reminded me that you know your community better than anyone else. And in doing that assessment, you'll know even more about what is needed and um, how to do that. So at Temple Beth Hatfilo, um, they did their survey, and they created um, programming based on that survey that was really targeted to the needs and desires of that congregation. So they had ongoing conversations on topics related to death and dying, but they included Jewish rituals and practices and how to not only prepare advanced directives and other legal documents, but also in how to write your legacy letter or um, a, an ethical will, it's sometimes called in the, in the Jewish tradition. And they went so far as to get the buy-in from their senior clergy, that they have actually a special um, section on their website for Kavod conversations, and Kavod means caring. So these are caring conversations, and they update that um, and the calendar and the newsletter. They are, have a presence in their community now for um, that this is something that their community attends to and has infused with the life of their congregation. So you've heard this uh, early on when we talked about setting aims and also doing measurement. I want to just for a moment just pause about the value of evaluations. Why do we do evaluations? Well, there's three reasons. We do it, first of all, for yourself. It helps you to understand and measure your progress and your success by um, asking people what they thought of a program as we do at the end of each of these calls we learn something about how we can improve the next time. Evaluations will help you determine the best use of your resources, your expertise, and your time. And it helps identify where you need to, where you might need help from other people. So um, looking at how your event went, you had your team of two or three people set up the room and then run the event and then someone is actually making sure that the food is okay and there's also cleanup that's needed afterwards and also making sure people got the evaluations or the follow-up commitment cards. Uh, it turned out that maybe three people wasn't enough in your large group and in doing an evaluation either by doing a quick debrief afterwards with your team or getting written evaluations from the people who attended, you learn about what other resources, what other expertise, what other bodies you need in the room to help you be successful the next time. By having evaluation data, um, feedback from people who have attended, it um, does something to pull in your community members, right? So you, like doing the survey, uh, you find out ahead of time what people are interested in. You might find people who can help you. Doing a post-event survey, you might find out that there are people who wrote and said, this was so great. Let me know how I can help you. You've identified more people for your team, so your bench is deeper. And with data in hand, it also gives you an ability to push your information out. And depending on how large an organization you are, and not only for congregations, but say you're a healthcare um, organization or community-based organization that wants to be working with congregations, and you've started doing this. Ronnie will talk to us a little bit about this next week. 
working with other groups beyond your own congregation, um, that you have evaluation data that lets you go back or out to funders or to media or to additional partners to say, there's a hunger for this information. This is a project that was well received. We'd like to spread this throughout our region. Can you help us? And of course, it's helpful for us. If you do evaluations on your programming and then feed that information back to us or the wider advanced care planning community, whether that's healthcare um, or community-based organizations or funders, we begin to see what the changes are, what's happening in the culture as we shift. Um, this is the shift we're looking to do. You're a part of it. We need you to be doing this work, and we need to get the data back about how is it going, what's really working. So some ideas for how can you evaluate or how can you collect information. It's pretty simple, really. Um, for example, you want to find out how many people are going to be at your event. You can have pre-registration. Or when people walk in the door, you have sign-in sheets. It's that simple. It can be paper-based, but you can also use text. People can email you. Collecting the data is very useful to know how many people are going to be there and then how many people actually showed up. We'll be sharing some information on our call tomorrow about how you can do event polling right there in the middle of your event or at the end of your event by asking people to go on to one of the sites that we'll talk about tomorrow. That's just like people pull out their phone and they can just simple text send you uh, a message and let you know how it goes. You save paper, you grab people, especially younger people, uh, in the moment. And an end of event valuations. Again, we have this information available for you on our website in the Resource Center. In a section, as you scroll down the Resource Center, there is actually um, a pull down menu on measurement and evaluations. And you'll find things like um, a commitment card that you could print and hand out. Let's see, we've got one right here. No, that's not it. We'll find it. Um, but commitment cards. We have um, tracking sheets. We have uh, forms that you can use as an evaluation that you could use right, right print out and just hand out. Um, and Naomi has put the link to those resources in our chat, and you'll receive that also in the follow-up call uh, email. Some other ways that you can find out after your event, how does it go? We've been using something, uh, an email survey monkey. Survey monkey is actually a platform that helps you, allows you to design a, um, a questionnaire that's fairly simple. And then when people respond to it online, it populates that information into a, um, a database so that you can go and see, well, how many people thought it was good, very good, not so good, wish I had skipped it, you know, whatever your categories are. You can also, let's say you do a starter kit workshop and you want to have a follow-up session about a month or six weeks later to find out how did people's conversations go, what else do they need to know. You could do an evaluation right at the beginning of the second session to gather information about the, from the first session and to give them, they can give you their feedback right there in the moment. We also found that in some congregations, these Evaluations just don't work. Um, people don't fill out the pieces of paper. And it takes some really dedicated uh, time, energy, and passion to make follow-up calls or send follow-up texts to people. I will say that's one thing we have learned is that people do respond better to texts or to calls from people that they know more than they respond to an email request for a survey question. You can also do some very simple counting right there in the moment. Uh, for those of you who are on the computer right now, you'll see a slide in the lower right-hand corner. Um, if we could make that bigger, what that is is a flip chart. And people were handed little sticky dots um, at the end of the event, or the little sheets of sticky dots. And you could put up in on the, the flip chart right then and there. Uh, whether or not you have assigned a healthcare agent or whether you have an advanced directive or whether you had the conversation. Um, and then people could literally count 
the planners could count and say, okay, this is how many people did these things after our first session. Or it could be an intentional count the first time after the first workshop. And when you come back for the second workshop, did their intentions match their actions? So you can just a simple count um, by putting dots up. And with that overwhelming amount of information, <laughs> I am now going to uh, take a breath, take a pause, and introduce, uh, welcome Audrey Marsh onto the call, who's our ministry lead for the gift of peace at St. John the Evangelist Roman Catholic Church in Columbia, Maryland. Good evening, Audrey. Good evening. So great to have you here. Now, Audrey, we can do um, one of two things. We can hand you the ball and let you advance your slides, or I can advance slides as I ask you some questions. Um, go ahead and ask the questions, because I tend to talk too much. So OK. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. Well, we have plenty of time. We'd love to hear from you. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, the work that you, uh, about your congregation and um, a little bit about its demographics, and also, why did you want to take on this work? So um, we have a huge congregation of about 3,000 people, but 1,500 are in our Spanish congregation. Um, if you can think of a culture or ethnicity, ethnic, ethnic group, it's probably in our parish. Um, we have. We have taken in refugees over the years who have stayed in the parish. There are, um, are so, it's so culturally diverse and economically diverse. Um, and very, um, I would say, um, it, in the past, it has been like a little more progressive than some people in our, in our Catholic community would like. We have we have matured with the age of the congregation, <laughs> and we're a little little more traditional now. Where it's a little traditional and a little forward thinking, so it's it's a really good balance now. Wonderful. Um, I got a um, a call from our pastor when he was visited by the Horizon Foundation for the second or third time because he forgot um, to. Um, be part of the pilot of the conversation project. And I had just been in his office about two weeks before, and I did the thing that you don't do in churches a lot. Um, I went in and said, I'm retired. I want to volunteer. <laughs> um, and I don't want something that's somebody else's, quote, territory. Because mm -hmm. we all know what happens in faith communities. If it's yours, it's yours and don't mess with it. <laughs> so I was like, I want to do my own thing. Um, so tell me what you want done. And originally he was going to have me handle the streaming of the masses for nursing homes and care facilities and things. And then this day, while they're in his office, he calls me and says, oh, I have a project for you. Um, and I laugh, but I really felt it was a gift because I had experienced both of my parents' deaths and my mother-in-law's very mm. different levels of preparation, very different levels of them, um, of dementia and um, different types of illnesses. One was sudden, one was severe dementia. One was totally, had every piece of paperwork you could imagine and the hospital couldn't find it. Mm. And so they put her on life support. So none of them had a beautiful death. Mm. And um, I thought, oh, this is my opportunity to prevent this from happening to somebody else as best mm. I can. And so um, it really, when I started getting more information about it, it really became a passion for me. Mm. And um, I was a little intimidated initially because as part of the pilot, we had these, um, instead of webinar, we had these one whole day sessions. Well, we were late. We had already missed one. So we came in and we were like in the middle of this and panicking. Um, and I had recruited 
um, in the parish, we had about 10 people express an interest. Um, after going to the all-day session and a couple of them panicking and having young families at home, they were like, this is not for us. We were told hmm. in the beginning it was ideal to have four or five, four or five people max in, on the team to get it mm -hmm. going. And this was ideal. So you can see it was, it was me because I'm the organizer, um, a former priest, um, the person who ran our resurrection ministry, um, a lawyer who was also trained in grief, grief ministry, and a nurse who had lost her husband within that year, mm. suddenly. Um, so we all had very different, we came at it from very different ways and different personalities, but we all agreed on the importance of planning and researching before we threw anything out there. So tell me a little bit about that. Um, I know that you set a, a, an aim, which I'm just going to, we talked about, that you want to reach at least 100 fellow parishioners about various issues related to end of life and to focus on the, the conversation project. Um, and to get someone to identify, the action you want people to take was for them to identify an individual to serve as their designated healthcare agent by the end of the pilot project. So you set up that aim, and then you set up some ways that you wanted to measure and track how people, uh, how many people were involved. So we have a slide here that um, tells us a little bit about that measurement, but I'm wondering, how did having this aim and knowing that you were going to do some measurement, how did that um, help you prepare or plan for success? How did that impact the work that you did? What difference did it make that you had that mindset? You brought us to the table, like that second presentation, that second day long thing. We got a, we got instructional measurement. And if you can remember, I was like, this is never going to work in, in a religious organization. Mm -hmm. um, and I kept thinking about all the measurement stuff back then. And it was really tied to health groups because it was mm -hmm. all about how many people how many people did you succeed with? Um, and um, I was like, well, you know, in certain health organizations, you can require people to do the paperwork and name the health agent and everything. But in a religious congregation, it's all about encouraging mm -hmm. and um, supporting them in doing that. So we were looking for types of measurement that would show that we had been somewhat successful, um, but we also didn't have, um, we didn't have a lot of expectations about the, what the results would be. Mm -hmm. So um, we tracked the number of people who were attending, um, mm -hmm. and then we said afterwards we would, we were using Sign Up Genius um, because for a certain number, it's free, and if you pay a minimal fee, you there's no um, advertisements and there's no um, sending your name out to other people. You don't get emails as a result of being on Sign Up Genius. So we use that to um, have people register in advance, but we also use that afterwards as one of the ways of sending out the um, request for people to. Um, do answer those those just check those boxes because we didn't want them go in we didn't want to go into a lot of detail with the things they had to answer mm -hmm. so we waited until the right at the end of the pilot and we sent out the email and said you can respond to the email and go into sign up genius and check the appropriate boxes or we'll have cards at mass you just throw them in the collection basket so we had okay to love them. that. Yeah, and we just they checked, and so we had we had the conversation. We planned to have the conversation. We have the health agent. We planned to ha name a health agent, and we included that I do not plan because that would tell us um, who was um, who either had not you know even though it was anonymous, it would give us numbers of people who wanted no part of this. Right, after they were part of it, they they have no intention of continuing. Right. right. And what did you learn? Part of it did plan. Uh -huh. um, we also had the feedback forms, mm -hmm. the sample of the one for the conversation project. And then okay. we had the two panels. We had the one with the um, 
all about funerals, Catholic perspective and the um, um, resurrection ministry and the um, um, the funeral director. One sec. Mm -hmm. Sounds like there's a, a furry friend who's come in to get your attention. So while she's taking care of that, we're also looking at a feedback form that she used with had some questions like, what is one idea or insight from this workshop that's personally meaningful for you? What aspect of the workshop did you like the best? And in what ways can this workshop experience be improved? So as you can see, those are all ideas that would give them feedback about how to improve and what to offer in the future. I'm sorry. I'm it's back. okay. Um, we just went through your feedback form, and right. I've moved we on had, to like one other question on the for the panels because we have another had another panel with the medical and the legal aspects, and so we had um, an extra thing on their evaluation that said, "What other topics would you like to see next year?" Oh, great. So, um, so then, um, so this is learning and planning and all kind of combined together. But um, before the Sabbath Sunday initiation in the parish, um, we attempted to run a pilot by inviting the um, parish board and some of the existing ministries. Mm -hmm. And we offered it at three times. We had one person sign up. Wow. And it, it was really disappointing. And even though the priests were so behind it, uh, they hadn't had the Sabbath Sunday initiation yet, and they hadn't talked to the parish board about it. Um, and so this is where I say the importance of being tied into those processes and hierarchy are really um, significant because some parish boards, um, you're not, people are not welcome to come and just um, explain and present, mm -hmm. the, parish, the pastor has to do it. Mm -hmm. So we, we, it was a little pushback because of that. So mm -hmm. we switched to another approach. We, we went to some people we knew. There was a marriage encounter group that's in our age group that had been together for 25 years. And every month they just to get together as a social and have a speaker. So we asked them if we could get on their calendar. They were phenomenal. They have so many speakers. They they get we gave them a shortened version of our workshop mm -hmm. and after that presentation we ended up totally revamping the entire thing mm -hmm. and we're still using that version of the workshop the only thing we did after after we put it together was we created a timetable so we have it down to three minute intervals you know like five minutes here seven minutes three minutes Oh, about what you're going to talk about in the workshop. What you're talking about how much to keep everybody on target. And mm -hmm. so people got out on time. We thought that was important. Um, yes, yes. And so we wanted to allow enough time. And we still use the same thing. We've adjusted the time since last year. But other than that, it ha it really worked. So, um, And then as far as the panels and all, we use the feedback recommendations to come up with the topics for this year because we we had um, we had we thought we had the panels you know into a more effective time frame than the ones we had researched in advance mm -hmm. and we found out we didn't um, there just wasn't enough time and so we decided this year to go with individual speakers so every month we had a different speaker. So let me um, let me just press into that a little bit. When you say you didn't have enough time, what kind of lead time were you talking about that you found you did need to have? Well, no, it wasn't even the lead time. It just was not enough time to cover the material. We had been to our archdiocese pro provides um, panels for mm -hmm. churches, so we went out to several of these to listen to the speakers. Well, there would be like ten speakers. And they each got about 10 minutes, if you were lucky, on every topic imaginable. And how interesting or overwhelming was that? It was overwhelming. <laughs> there was no time for questions. It was just, it was too much. So right. we split it up, three speakers, 
um, in an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And um, that was still, there were still so many more questions on each of the topics. Yes. So um, this year we opted, we're do, we did one hour presentations after one of the masses with additional topics and expansions on some of the topics that we had last year. So that's great learning. You went out into the community, kind of saw what others were offering, thought maybe this isn't quite right for our community. Right. And even after you tried it with, you know, a pared down thing, it was like you realized that having more airtime for people to ask questions and engage, I think that you've hit on something really important. Um, we, if we go to something where people talk at us, and we don't get to participate back on a topic that's as intimate and, and meaningful as this, it doesn't sink in the same way. Everyone, you know, people just needed some time to process that information or ask questions so they get a clearer idea. Great learning uh, and great feedback for um, planning in the future. It also helped us to know who the speakers were in advance. Mm -hmm. Because the and time we've had an unsuccessful speaker is one we didn't hear personally mm -hmm. work with them, but we had one this year that we were not happy with. Um, cool. She totally backed up everything we were doing, but she repeated everything we had already done, and there was mm -hmm. nothing new in her presentation. So if we had heard her instead of just had her come in, we would have been better. So we, right. had, we liked having – knowing what they were going to say before they came in. Right, and also letting them, a presenter, know, you know, we're kind of deep into this work. This is, we're not, this is not our first outing on this topic, so let us tell you what we've already done. Could you oh. modify your program so that your presentation... We sat for two hours. <laughs> uh, and still didn't work out. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. So, so even with good planning, we sometimes have unexpected results. Sometimes people are out to sell something as opposed to provide a service. Mm. That's what happened to us on this one, and we just – so otherwise, we have, we, have, we have one lawyer who came last year, couldn't wait to come back this year. She's already said she'll come next year, and she's an elder law attorney, and she's been fabulous. And, um, every, I mean, the attendance goes up when they hear she's coming. So, um, yeah. So, so the legal presentation was a popular one. Oh, yes. Last year she did, mostly did, you know, um, documentation for end of life. But this, this time we zeroed in on um, dealing uh, how to prepare, how families prepare for member, members of the family who have dementia, um, Alzheimer's, or disabilities. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And, she was wonderful, yeah. So, so there are a lot of ideas. Um, you've had a tremendous impact. I'm just looking at our time, and I want to get through a couple of other quick sure. points. You've had terrific um, feedback, and you've had a, a, a rippling effect in your community. People are already coming and saying, what's next? We want to, I was, this is amazing. I'm so glad I came. And you're hearing that there's an, a hunger for more information on legal issues at different levels for the group of people who heard her the first time. And one of the things I want to just mention is there will be a new group will come through who will want to hear the first presentation as well because maybe they weren't ready then and they're getting ready now. Um, so um, in your – Videos of everything, except the conversation workshop, everything's videoed. That's great. And available in our library. So. That's right. So um, some of the great overarching lessons and challenges in your lessons that your planning and, and practice really paid off, and you learned how key it is to get buy-in from your clergy and also get those clergy to communicate um, as promised with your board so that you can be uh, welcomed more receptively when you do want to present. And that some of your obstacles had been administrative um, and, and political. You had some terrific words of wisdom that we're going to share with everyone in the follow-up email. And the, but the key word here was celebrate, that you celebrated your clergy, you celebrated your congregation. Uh, personally, you've acknowledged, and with each other and with us, certainly, that you feel really blessed to be in the parish uh, where your efforts are so appreciated um, and how important this has been for you. Uh, for those of you who are on a computer now, you can see that some of the 
the feedback, the written feedback that Audrey and her team received is posted here. And I will say, we talked about the evaluation process. There's something about this feedback that can be so uh, invigorating and inspiring to help you You've worked so hard to plan, to implement, to do the prep and the cleanup. To get this kind of feedback, what kind of difference does this make for you, Audrey? It's amazing. When we read, we were expecting to get improvements. We got nothing for improvements, except one day the room wasn't ready or early enough, and so we were about 15 minutes late getting out, and somebody said, you got to stay on time. Other than that, we have had nothing that came back as, you should improve this. Great, and people are so appreciative about how helpful it was to them and to their families. Um, they answered, you were answering a true need in your congregation. Um, they think perhaps you should bring the Pope next time, because uh, probably so that he could learn a few things. So with that, I want to just thank you so much for all the work that you've done and, and how much you've done to serve your congregation and, and to share with us the things that you've learned. I want to point people to some of our additional resources that are available on the conversationproject.org, uh, information about measurement, evaluation, and tracking. And um, I just uh, want to thank Audrey and thank you all for being part of tonight's call. I, for our next session, it's our final session to as you go from this week to next, uh, as you think about getting started in your congregation or your community, consider how you might assess the needs and desires for programming in your setting and uh, how to uh, assess the resources that you will have. Please take the time uh, this week to review the Getting Started in Congregations Guide so that you know that that's there for you. We'd love to get your feedback on it. And to prepare for our call next week where we'll be wrapping it up and bringing it all together, we hope that you will either bring questions about infusing uh, the conversation project into the life and work of your congregation or even email us in advance. What would you like to hear about on this final call? What have we missed? What are you still hungry to know about? Our call will be on Tuesday, May 22nd at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. And please, before shutting down your computer, as you exit out of the webinar, um, don't close your laptop. Don't shut it off. Wait until the survey pops up. And even if you've responded before, we'd love to know your opinions about the content and delivery of this session. We hope you have a beautiful week, everyone. Our thanks again to Audrey. Um, uh, people can email their questions to nfedna, N as in Nancy, F-E-D-N-A, at IHI.org. We'll pop that into the chat right now so you'll see um, her email. Thanks, everyone. Take care.